Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. We pray, O oh Lord, today you shower your blessings upon everyone in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, you bring your people out of their dungeon and bring them to the mountain top of blessing in Jesus' name. We pray that you open the heavens, you shower the rays down, and you fill every heart and every house and every family with your blessings in Jesus' name. Be glorified and exalted. Edify your people and bless your people. We pray that your hand will be mighty upon everyone. Open our eyes as we study your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Today we're looking at a special study. And we have this special study because actually this year has been a special year for everyone. And the Lord reminds us today that He brings us out of something. And He brings us into another thing. And that's what we're looking at today, out of great obstacles to glorious opportunities. Out of, and then into. We're looking at Zechariah chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 7. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou shalt be, become a plain, and he shall bring forth. The headstone thereof was shouting, his crying, grace, grace unto each. As the Lord leads us out of our predicament, out of our problem, seeing to his blessing, you'll find that he multiplies blessings upon his people from faith to faith, from grace to grace, from glory to glory, shouting grace, grace unto each. You've learned about the life of Joseph. And you see what he said in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. But as for you, talking to his brothers, but as for you, talking to his detractors, but as for you, talking to his persecutors, but as for you, talking to the people that wanted to kill the dream and kill the dreamer, but as for you, talking to the people that thought that the promise of God will not be fulfilled in his life, but as for you, he thought he would against me. But God meant it unto good. And whatever evil anybody has thought towards you, God is going to transform everything to good in Jesus' name. To bring to pass as it is this day. To save much people alive. That reminds us of the word of the Lord to every child of God in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know. That all things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. The people who are called according to his purpose. God works mightily in, in their lives. He brings them out of great obstacles. And he brings them to glorious opportunities. I want you to write those words now. Out of. And then into. In fact, as you look at the life of David, at the life of Joseph, that's exactly what you're going to find. Out of, and then into. Look at Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 14, you'll find those words right there. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and he brought him hastily. Out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. That's always the way God works with his own people. Bringing them out of. And then bringing them into. Look at that principle in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 8. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Looking at verse 8. He raises up the poor out of. That's what he does. That's the principle of the word of God. That's the manifestation of the power of God. That he raises up the poor out of the dust. And lifts up the beggar from the donkey to set them among princes. And to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he has set the world upon them. As the Lord concludes and 
summarizes what he did for the children of Israel. That's exactly what he said. Out of into. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're looking at verse 23. And he brought us out from this, out of, that he might bring us in to give us the land which is where unto our fathers. He brought us out, out of bondage, out of captivity, out of the land of Egypt, out of the persecution. And then he brought us into that land flowing with milk and honey. It was the testimony of David in Psalm 40. As we look at Psalm 40, and we're looking at verse 2, Psalm 40, looking at verse 2. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit. Do you see the experience of the children of God when you come to the Lord and you have faith in God? That's what He does. He brings you out of, out of an horrible pit, out of the merry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. As uh, the children of Israel disobeyed the Lord, and they went into captivity, and the Lord sent Ezekiel to them, and he said, I'll save you, I'll sanctify you, I will fill you with the Holy Ghost. And then he prefaced that with, out of, and into Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. In Ezekiel chapter 20, 36, verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all the countries, and will bring you into your own land. When the Lord wants to favor his people, he looks at their condition, and he says, I'm going to bring you out of. And then I will bring you into. And the process by which he does that, he tells us in verse 25, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. He'll save them. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will sanctify you. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgment. And do them. I will fill you with the Holy Ghost. In Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 12. Out of and into Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 20, verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. That's what he does for his own people. And when you come to the Lord and you have faith in God, that's what he does for you. And then whatever problems you have, whatever challenges have been in the past in your life, it brings you out of and it brings you into a new experience. First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But here he chose in generation. A royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He brings you out of, and he brings you into. And isn't that out of my bondage, sorrow, and night? Into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my want, into thy wealth. Out of my sin, into thyself. It brings you out of something, and then it brings you into another thing. Out of my shameful failure and loss, into the glorious gain of thy cross. Out of our sorrow, into thy balm. Out of life's storms, into thy calm. Out of distress, into jubilant psalm. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, into thy blessed will to abide. Out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair, into raptures above. Out of the fear and the dread of the tomb. Into the joy and light of my home, out of the depths of ruins untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold, Jesus, 
I come to thee. That's why we come today. And the Lord will bring you out of every negative thing and bring you to the positive in Jesus' name. With faith anchored in God's word, we're taken out of obstacles and we're brought into opportunities. We're taken out of barriers and we're brought into blessings. We're taken out of stumbling blocks to come into stepping stones. We're taken out of persecution and we're coming to promotion. Out of our weakness, we're coming to his wealth. Out of rejection, we're coming to royalty. Out of the problems of life, we're coming to his prosperity. Out of the hatred of men, we're coming to the happiness we have in God. He gives us grace and power and purpose and the promises so that the great mountains will not be able to stop our progress. And brothers and sisters, we're moving on to progress. Nothing can stop you in Jesus' name. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, great obstacles before God's favored people. Number two, God's gracious obedience of God's faithful people. Number three, glorious opportunities for God's fulfilled people. Let's come back to number one. Great obstacles before God's favored people. Why would we look at obstacles before God's favored people? Because everybody has obstacles. Everybody, men, women, boys, girls, young people, everybody has obstacles. But you know what? Whenever you have obstacles, you think this is the edge of the road. No, not at all. It's just the beginning of the road. All those obstacles will mount over them. And we're going to overcome them. As you look at the favored people in the Bible, and you start with a person like Abraham. And then you go to Jacob, then you go to, you go to Joseph, and then you go to Joshua or Moses or any of those other people, or David or Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Or you come to the New Testament, our Lord and Savior himself. Yes, there were obstacles. Judas Iscariot thought he could hinder the fulfillment of God's purpose in the life of Jesus. And all the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought they could hinder the Lord Jesus Christ, but they could not. And then when eventually they crucified him, they put the stone on the tomb. But on the glorious Sunday morning, the angel came and rolled away the stone. Because there is nothing that can hinder the people of God. You are thinking about Peter. You are thinking about John and James. You are thinking about Paul the Apostle. Yes, the arch obstacles. And we have itemized the obstacles that the people of God arch in those days. And the obstacles we still have today. Number one, persecutions. Number two, pride. Sometimes it comes from within. Many of the obstacles are coming from without. But sometimes the obstacle is coming from within. Pride. Number three, people. Number four, personalities. Number five, prophets. Number six, prosperity. Number seven, pleasure. Number eight, position. Let's look at them one by one. The obstacles that challenge the people of God. The obstacles that are placed before the people of God. And yet, through it all, the Lord is able to get you out of those obstacles and bring you to a glorious, redemptive, purpose, plan, progress, and opportunity. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Every turn of the way, every moment of the time, Paul the Apostle had difficulties, persecution, mountains before him, obstacles before him. And, they, and yet he said, but I want to tell you, all those obstacles, they are not able to cancel the purpose and the plan of God for my life. Because a great door, an effectual door is opened unto me in spite of those obstacles. It tells us the results of the work of God in spite of the obstacles in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 12. But I would, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the fortress of the gospel. All those obstacles, all the persecution, all the beating, all the imprisonment, 
Everything has resulted into the spread of the gospel, the multiplication of converts, and the planting of churches for the furtherance of the gospel, so that in verse 13, my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxes confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And that's what happened. Although the persecutions were there, yet he was victorious. And although there may be persecution in your life, you will be victorious. Yeah. I said you will be victorious. Yeah. Uh, you just make up your mind. You'll be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. That no matter what people do in your neighborhood, no matter what people do in your family circle, no matter what people do in your place of work, what the Lord has purposed for you, you are going to have in Jesus' name. But you must take care that the obstacle is not coming from your own heart. Let me show you an example of what I mean. In 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 1. Now Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And then the solution came to him. You can be cleansed from your leprosy. A little maid had given testimony to the power of God, and that if he would go to the right place at the right time, he'll have deliverance and cleansing from the leprosy. Well, to start with, he went to the wrong place. But the Lord still had mercy on him. He was redirected to the right place. And now we look at it from verse 8, and it was so. When Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Very simple. Just go to Jordan, not too far away from you, from where you are now. And dip yourself seven times, you'll be clean. Your leprosy will go away. You'll come out of shame, and you'll come into the shining light of the miracle-working power of God. But pride will not allow him. How many people have such pride in their hearts? When the word of God comes to you, there is but one thing to do, just obey. But many people will argue. Many people will try to find a better way. Many people will try to prove that they know more than God. But then, look at what he did. But Naaman was wrath. And he went away and said, Behold, I thought that he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. And not a banner and farpa, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. What an obstacle. Pride may hinder you from getting your miracle. And a lot of blessings are waiting for every one of us. If we will humble ourselves. The, 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 the great problems in our lives. The birch in your life. The shame in your life. The reproach in your life. That the Lord will just roll it away like that. In a single moment at the, at the token of an eye. But if pride comes between us and the blessing. We may miss the blessing. But if you'll make up your mind that I'm going to be there, I'm going to listen to the word of God, I'll be there on time. And when I'm there, I'm going to do everything the Lord is telling me to do through the minister. In his own case, he was comparing Abana and Papa, rivers of Damascus, where he came from. May I not go there and wash and be clean? No, you can't. If the Lord has not purposed that that's where to get the healing, you'll not get it. You may go to Abana, you may go to Farpa, you may hear about all the other things. If there is a place the Lord has reserved for you, that is where to get the miracle. That's the place to get it, no other place. And then we're told, and his servants came near, and they spake unto him and said, My father, 
If the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather, when he says to thee, wash and be clean, then went he down. He threw away his pride and he went down. You need to come down from your tower of pride and come down. He went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Everybody say he was clean. That, that's how to get it. If you will remove pride, and you will not allow pride to be an obstacle, every blessing you want, the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. Uh, not only persecution, not only pride, there are people. In Second Samuel chapter 3, Second Samuel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 39. And I am this day weak, though anointed king. Here is David talking about himself. He had been anointed as a king. And then he said, but now I am weak. Although I'm anointed as a king. Why are you weak, David? These men, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. The sons of Zeruiah, eh, they will not allow the purpose of God to just go smoothly. Their wickedness, their treasury, their persecution, and their killing of innocent people will not allow David to enjoy the blessing. He said, these sons of Zeruiah are too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Number four, we have principalities. Principalities. If you look at Second Samuel chapter five, Second Samuel chapter five, I'm reading from verse one. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king of us, thou was he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. But before that chapter ran out, you'll find what happened. Look at verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. And the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hand. The point is this, that these principalities, that is the principal men in the enemy's camp, when they heard that David had been anointed king, they came to seek for him to fight against him. That's what they always do. They have not changed. That when the Lord has promoted you, when the Lord has anointed you, when the Lord has promised you, when the Lord has brought you to the place he said he will bring you to, and then those principalities are there. They want to fight against you and against the progress of your life, but they will not succeed. I said they will not succeed. Look at verse 10. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him, in spite of the people, in spite of the principalities. In spite of the persecution, in spite of everything, he went on and he grew greater. And sometimes number five is the false prophets that will try to distract you and derail you and make you to go in the right direction. And um, you know the reality of that. You'll see billboards, you'll see banners, you'll see announcements. Prophets, they say, the prophet is coming, the prophet is coming. And then, as you have been following the Lord, you, you leave the narrow path that leads to the kingdom of God. And then you go astray, and you go after some prophets. And you think that this may happen, that may happen. And eventually you become disillusioned. And then all your faithfulness of the past, everything evaporates away. You have to start all over again. Because you have said things and done things and gone places you shouldn't have gone. But you see, those prophets can actually derail you. If you look at uh, Micah chapter 3, in Micah 
chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 5. Micah chapter 3 verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. They make my people go astray. They don't actually preach the gospel. They don't exalt Jesus Christ as Savior. And they don't emphasize salvation. And they're not going to mention repentance, turning away from sin. And then turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, be believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and becoming free from your sin. They're not going to emphasize that. And then they will get you on another train, on another tangent, on another line. And you'll think that, well, this also goes for, especially if you see some dramatic things uh, that appear to be taking place. And, it, and those things are physical. Those things are physical. People jump up and fall down, lie on the ground and all that. And we say, what a great power of God. We're talking about repentance. We're talking about reconciliation with God. We're talking of righteousness. We're talking of a change of life. That the Lord will move into your life and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you. And smokers will smoke no more. Drunkers will drink no more. And the people living in sin will live in sin no more. And the Lord gives you the power to go and sin no more. If all that is not being emphasized, what's, what's the rest? All the drama and every other thing you see, if there is no salvation from sin, Freedom from sin. There's nothing else there. It tells us in that verse 5, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth, and cry peace, and he and he that putteth not into, the, into their mouth, they even prepare war against him. Therefore, night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you. That ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their leaves, for there is no answer of God. False prophets can be a hindrance, they can be an obstacle before you. Number six, prosperity can even be an obstacle to you. We learn of a man that came to the Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to know the way of life everlasting. In Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 17. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do, that I may inherit eternal life? He appeared to want eternal life. After death, he wanted to get to heaven. He wanted to live forever with God. In verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, and take up thy cross, the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that same, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. His prosperity was an obstacle to him, hindering him from having life eternal. Are there not people in our land, people in our nation, people in Africa, people outside Africa, that are hindered from life eternal because of prosperity? Hey, if I come to Christ, I may not be able to give bribes anymore. I may not be able to take those bribes anymore. If I come to Christ, I may not be able to do the things I've been doing. And that's the only way I've been getting money. I may not be able to falsify accounts anymore. And they cannot come to the Lord. Because prosperity becomes their hindrance and obstacle. And if you are like that, you need to break loose from it. Because if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul, how you, what story are you going to tell in eternity? In verse 23, And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? There are many hindrances before the people having riches. They themselves are hindrances to themselves. They will not want to come to a place you are preaching some doctrine. They want you to lower the standard for them. They want you to have a different doctrine for them. They want you to give them liberty to divorce their wives and marry another. After all, am I not rich? 
And if you teach restitution to those poor people, illiterate people, are you going to teach restitution to us, managers and directors? Their prosperity and position will be a great hindrance to them to get to the kingdom of God. That's one hindrance. Another hindrance, the preachers themselves are hindrances to the people who are rich. Anytime you, you know, some of these preachers, whenever they see maybe a king coming from a territory, a chief coming from a village, and they, they just say, well, thank God kings are coming, chiefs are coming, they will not tell them about their idolatry, about their witchcraft, about everything they are doing that they shouldn't do. They will just pet them and whitewash everything, and those people cannot be saved. And sometimes when they see those directors and managers and they see those rich people, they don't want to talk about the serious things of the kingdom of God. Because if they told them those serious things, they will not remain in their church. And they want those rich people to remain in their churches. Even if they don't get to heaven, those preachers are going to be hindrances and obstacles to the rich men getting to the kingdom of God. The world is a hindrance to those rich people. They will come to them. If they see any of the rich people getting serious, looking for eternal life, repenting of their sins, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, making restitution in marriage, restitution in their place of work, they will come to them and say, you of all people, going to join those people, people of righteousness, of restitution, people that are going to be taught, read the whole Bible, study the whole Bible, you of all people, joining such people, the world will be a hindrance to them. And if you happen to be one of the rich people, don't allow it to keep you back. Abraham was rich, but he gave everything to God. And we have Job, he had everything, but all the same, he made God number one in his life. If you will make God number one in your life, the riches will not be a hindrance to you. Look at it again in verse 23. Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and says unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Obstacles before people. Persecution. Pride. People. Principalities, prophets, prosperity, pleasure. In the case of Solomon, it was pleasure that hindered him, or wanting to satisfy the flesh. But the Lord is calling us to self-control. He's calling us to uh, crucify ourselves to the world. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, it is Christ that liveth in me. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Let's see how pleasure hindered this man. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. And I said in mine heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mercy. Therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of flatter it is mad. And of mirth, what doest it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold of folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, and I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees and them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pull of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and, and servants born in my house. Also, I had great possession of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of the kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as music and instruments and uh, that of all sorts. Do you know there are some people that do not want to come to a church like this? The solemn music is not, is not okay for them. It doesn't satisfy them. And the music that has meaning, the wordings that have meaning, that doesn't have any meaning to them. They're looking for drums. 
They're looking for dancing. They're looking for worldly music to come into the church. And if that were coming, they say, Aha, now you understand that we people of the world are music lovers. All your kind of hymns and songs and all those, uh, Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. I want to be like thee. Stamp your image on my heart. What are we going to do with that? And when they just sing and they will not even move and they will not dance, they will not hold anybody. That's what they're looking for. And it is that kind of pleasure that will hinder some people staying in a church like this. They don't want to take the serious word of God. Solomon said, I got all those things. And eventually the pleasure, those things hindered him from being the person he, want, he ought to be. In verse 9, so I was great. And increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought. And all the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. You see, pleasure hindered him. In fact, in the case of Solomon, he went so, he went so far. Uh, look at this in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm reading to you from verse 1 there. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Zidonians and the Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Solomon joined with them, stayed with them. And instead of following after the Lord fully, in fact, we are told in verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. His wife turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wife turned, his wives turned away his heart after all the gods. And his heart was not perfect, but the Lord is God, as was the heart of David his father. What was God at God's attitude to him? Verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And then, number 8, his position. What hinders people? Persecution. Pride. People, principalities, false prophets, prosperity, pleasure, position. In John chapter 12 verse 42, John chapter 12 verse 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. But in spite of those obstacles, those who are real children of God will still overcome in Jesus' name. Amen. Gracious obedience of God's faithful people. When you do not allow the obstacles to hinder you, and you say, I will count the cost. I am willing to lay down anything and everything, and I'm, go I'm not going to worry what men will say, what men will do to me. These are the people that overcome their obstacles. They are the people that commit themselves to obeying the Lord. And then they will be able to turn their obstacles to great, glorious opportunities. And that's what the Lord is expecting, that we will be obedient. I want you to find out in the Word of God how the Lord has exalted obedience to His Word, obedience to His will, above every other thing. And you will not allow any obstacle to hinder you, but you will be obedient to the Word of the Lord. And look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm reading to you from verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed. So love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. He wants you to obey him. 
And he wants you to love him. If you love him, you are going to obey him. And he wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He tells us in verse 7, And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of of the Lord and do all his commandments. Notice that, mark that in your Bible and do all and do all and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. He tells us in Genesis chapter 45, Genesis chapter 45, and I'm reading to you from verse 4 all through to verse 8. Genesis chapter 45, we're reading from verse 4. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 4, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And he came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Look at verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. What did God see in his life? Obedience to his word. Don't you remember when the temptation came to him? Genesis chapter 39. In Genesis chapter 39 verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, Lie with me. And he refused. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master knoweth not, watereth not, what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There, there is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then? How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What made the Lord to promote that man? Obedience to the word of God, remaining pure, remaining holy, even though the temptations were there, resisting the temptation. Of course, I'm sure you know, his father wasn't there, his mother wasn't there, his pastor wasn't there, his counselor wasn't there, a leader wasn't there to check him. Even his master wouldn't have known if he did anything with that woman. There was nobody to report it. And yet he said, whether people will know or they will not know. We're not serving men. We're not keeping away from sin because people will see us. And there are many people that pre pretend to be saved. And they, are, they will see if, uh, you know, the church will not know. If discipline will not come. If nobody will challenge them, they will see but the, the, the evidence that you are really born again and the evidence that the Lord is going to turn your obstacles into opportunities is that you will not sin, whether pastor is there or not, whether leaders are there or not, whether church members are there or not. And we're told in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and has followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and he shall possess it. Do you see the value of obedience there? Uh, the Lord said, because this man followed me fully. When all the other people are saying, no, we cannot obey the Lord. We cannot go up. Because there are giants in the land. And they allowed their fear of giants to cancel the fear of God from their heart. The Lord said, because... Caleb had followed me fully, and he was not afraid of man. He was go. He did my will because of that. I'll bring him into the land. Did he get into the land of promise? Yes, he did. Joshua chapter fourteen. In Joshua chapter fourteen, I'm reading from verse six. Joshua chapter fourteen, verse six. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Canaanite said unto him, Thou knowest the sin that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me, and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly Followed the Lord my God. That was his testimony. I wholly followed the Lord my God. It was that obedience. 
that healed the news to the Lord, that made the Lord to say, I'll give you the land. In verse 9, Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet has trod in, have trod in shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. Hear him. He says in verse 10, Now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day, first quarter, and for first quarter, and, four, and five years old, eighty-five years of age. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore, give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. You see, that was because he obeyed the Lord. And because he wholly followed the Lord, that's why the blessings came unto him. We are going to obey the Lord. And as we obey the Lord, you will find the blessings will be abundant in our lives in Jesus' name. Can I just show you the example of one woman that followed the Lord? She had obstacles. She had problems. She lost her husband. And then she didn't have any, anywhere with her, any way to find another husband. At least humanly speaking, discouragement could have come. Depression could have come. But then she said, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to obey the Lord. Let's look at her. Ruth chapter 1. In Ruth chapter 1. Uh, let's look at it from verse 5. Ruth chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. And Marlon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Ruth lost her husband as well as Oppam. And then we're told in verse 9, the Lord granted you, the Lord grants you that she may find rest each of you in the home of her husband. Go and remarry. And she, then she kissed them and he lifted up their voice and wept. And he said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And now me said, turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb? That they may be your husband's turn again, my daughters, go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, and I should, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Isn't this the challenge before young ladies or young sisters here today? And young men here today? Who are you going to get married to? Age is, uh, age is, uh, you know, telling on you. When are you going to get married? And when they consider it here and there, they cannot obey the word of God anymore. Be not unequally yoked together with some believers. And they will find a way to get to their village. And then they dishonor the Lord, they disobey the Lord, they disregard the word of God. And they are thinking blessings will still come. But look at this. Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them? For my being husbands, nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And he lifted up their voice and wept again, and Opa kissed her mother in law, but Ruth clave unto her. Opa said, The price is too much for me to pay. If that's what it takes for us to have blessing, I thought you'll just bless us. But uh, uh, from what you are telling me now, I don't think I'll be able to take that. But Ruth clave unto her, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. That's where Jesus was born. 
they came to Bethlehem. And Ruth became a great, great, great grandmother to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because she was going to obey the Lord. She wasn't going to allow anything to hinder her. Obedience is very important. Let's look at Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 23. In Exodus chapter 23, we're looking at verse 22. Exodus chapter 23, we're looking at verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries, if thou wilt indeed obey the word of the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us. What is it that will bring blessings into our lives? Obedience. Let's look at First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, verse 23. First Samuel chapter 15. In First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in bond offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. To obey is better than sacrifice. It is obedience the Lord is looking for in Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. Reading from verse 8 all through to verse 11. Job 36. We're reading from verse 8 through to verse 11. And he, they be bound in fetters, and beholding in courts of affliction. Then he showeth them their work, and their transgressions, that they have exceeded, he opened, he openeth also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity, if they obey and serve him. If they obey and serve him, gracious obedience of God's faithful people, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity, and their years in pleasures. It is obedience to the Lord that will actually grant the blessings unto us. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 through to verse 19. Isaiah chapter 1, from verse 16. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widows. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as carnage? They shall be as white as snow. Do they be red like crimson? They shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. If ye be willing and obedient, and the obedience the Lord is asking for is obedience from the very heart, from the depth of your heart. Not obedience from the lips. Not obedience that is superficial. Obedience from the heart. Romans chapter 6 verse 17. Romans 6 verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart. Have obeyed from the heart. Obeyed from the heart. What are we obeying from the heart? That form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. That form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Do you remember something we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30? Come back to it. I need to show you this. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading there in verse 8, And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments. And do all his Commandments. Can you think of the commandments of the Lord? Abide in me and let my word abide in you. Are you abiding in the Lord? To abide us to obey. Beware of false prophets. That's the commandment of the Lord. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed. Depart from evil and do good. Evangelize. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Are you doing it? That's the commandment of the Lord. Forgive. If you have bought against any, 
and you forgive 70 times seven times that's the commandment of the lord and are there not people that say i'm saved i'm born again i'm sanctified feel with the holy ghost and i'm a good standing member of the church are you obeying the commandments of the lord because it is in the obedience of the commandment of the lord that's when you are blessed give and it shall be given unto you a good measure pressed down, shaking together running over shall men put into your bosom that's the commandment of the lord hold fast Hold fast the form of doctrine which is delivered unto you. And it says you incline your ear, incline your heart to the watch of God. If those commandments are there, what are we doing? Are we obeying them? And it tells you to join with your wife or husband until death do you part. And there are not many people, they worship. They pray. They sing. They might even be manifesting some what they call gifts of the spirit. Are they remaining with their wives until they do, do them part? And then you keep the commandments of the Lord until the end of your life. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And you love your neighbor as yourself. You meditate on the word of God. This book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. You meditate therein, day and night. And then that you may observe to do all the commandments of the world. Then will you prosper and you have good success. We are told to nurture our children in the word of God. Are there not uh, men and women, fathers and mothers that neglect their children? You will not nurture them in the word of the Lord. Well, no matter what we profess, it says we are to obey all the commandments of the Lord. Are we obeying the commandments of the Lord? Observe and do. Preach the gospel. And be quiet and do your own business. Talkativeness, uh, that goes against the word of God. Be quiet and do your own work. Gossiping, going here and there, tell bearers that you are going against the commandment of the Lord. You learn to be quiet. You learn it. That's part of the Christian life. And then you restore. If you have stolen anything from anybody, the Lord says, go and restore. When you bring your gift before the altar, and there you remember somebody has sought against you, leave your gift there. Go and reconcile with your brother. That's the commandment of the Lord. Are we doing it? Because it is in the obedience to the word of God, we are actually going to have the blessings of the Lord. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, and then all this shall be added unto you. Train your child, train up your child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Unite with the people of God, that we endeavor to keep the unity of the faith. That we are united with the people of God, and we are not instruments of conflict and division. Unity is a commandment of the Lord for us. It tells you to visit the fathers and widows in their affliction. It tells us to watch and pray. It tells us to examine our lives. It tells us to yield ourselves to God and to be zealous of good works. We need to consider the commandments of the Lord and be obedient to those commandments of the Lord because it's in the obedience to those commandments of the Lord we are actually blessed in the Lord and by the Lord. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14 and then we'll go to verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, as obedient children, not living like we used to live, talking like we used to talk, drinking what we used to drink, wearing what we used to wear, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws, in your ignorance, in verse 22, seeing ye have purified your hearts, your souls, in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love, unpretending love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. The Lord is calling us to obedience, and as He calls us to obedience, He grants us the grace to be able to follow Him, and to follow through, and be obedient to Him, and will obey Him in Jesus' name. I need a good Amen. amen. What kind of obedience? Number one, unconditional obedience. You know, there are people that put condition on their obedience. The Lord has saved you, it's not so much for you. He has sanctified you, it's not so much for you. He's going to heaven to prepare a place for you. He's doing so much for you. But you say, Lord, you know, if I don't have a job, I'm not going to continue obeying you. If I don't have a wife, husband, or children, I'm not going to continue obeying you. Unconditional obedience. Number two, uncommon, unconventional obedience. 
that you just obey the Lord and you don't care what others do. You don't see other people. You make your own obedience uncommon. How about the obedience of Abraham? Abraham, here am I, Lord. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. And I will show you the mountain where you will sacrifice him to me. And the following morning he rose up early. And then the son said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. Here is the wood, here is the fire. Where is the sacrifice? Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? My son, don't worry. The Lord shall provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And he got to the place where the Lord had told him. And he set the wood. And he laid his son there, willing to obey the Lord. Uncommon, unconventional obedience. That's how the Lord blessed him. Number three, unconcealed, uncovered obedience. That we are not obeying the Lord privately. I won't allow them to know. I'll try and do it methodically. I'll do it with wisdom. Because a decree had been signed. If anybody will talk to any God or pray to any God within these 30 days, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. And what am I going to do? Don't I need to cover up my obedience at this time? And Daniel went to his house three times every day as he did a four time. And he opened his window towards Jerusalem. And he prayed like he used to pray. Unconcealed, uncovered obedience. Number four, uncompromising obedience. Except you fall down to my idol, I'm going to burn you in the fire. We cannot compromise. We must obey God rather than men. And they put their lives in their hands, not counting the cost. That's why the fourth, that is the Son of God, came to them in the fire, walking with them, and they had no hurt. Neither did the fire have any influence or effect or impact on them, because they obeyed their God. Number five, uncontaminated obedience. That you don't allow your obedience to be defiled, contaminated by other people, other things. Number six, uncomfortable obedience. When Peter and John went to the temple and that man was healed and he obeyed the word of the Lord because he told them to go and preach the word and they preached the word. They put them in the prison. It's not convenient. When Paul the apostle went to Philippi and he was in prison, but his son was Silas in the night, that obedience is not comfortable. And yet they obeyed the Lord. Unchanging obedience. Unchanging obedience. Whether you are in Babylon or you are in Israel, in Jerusalem or you are with the Chaldeans, you are purpose in your heart that you are going to obey the Lord and you will not be changing like a chameleon. You obey the Lord today. And then when you get to another situation, another community, you cannot obey the Lord but for these people of Bible days it was unchanging obedience I pray the Lord will give us the grace we will also obey the Lord in such a way and great will be the blessings of the Lord upon us in Jesus name as we obey the Lord then his blessings will continue to flow in our lives number three now glorious opportunities for God's fulfilled people glorious opportunities for God's fulfilled people. And let's come back to this a young man again. His name is Joseph. And you look at uh, Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. What a glorious opportunity at. Because they had fully obeyed the Lord. In Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. But as for you, he thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. To, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. He had obstacles. But then he faced the obstacles with obedience. And because of that obedience, glorious opportunities came in his life. And the Lord blessed him tremendously. Look at what the Father said about him in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough. Even a fruitful bough by, the, by a well whose branches run over the wall. When you are thinking of a blessing running over, running over, running over, my cup is filled and running over. Since the Lord saved me, I'm as happy as can be. My cup is full and running over. And that's what Joseph could have sung. Because his cup was full and running over. In verse 23, it says, The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode his strength, and the arms of his hand were made strong by the hand of the mighty God of Jacob. 
because he followed the Lord fully. Because he gave himself fully and wholeheartedly unto the Lord. And that's why the blessings came upon him. Did I tell you about Ruth? And did I tell you the sacrifice that she made? And did I tell you the commitment of that woman? Of course, the Lord blessed him. Why did the Lord bless her so, so much like that? Because of her faithfulness in obeying the Lord. Look at Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. As I think about her, this lady, verses 11 and 12. Ruth chapter 2, verse 11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, it has been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and hast come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, unto whose wings thou art come to trust. When you obey the Lord, and that's how he opens doors for you. Look at chapter 3 of Ruth, I'm reading from verse 10. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followedst not young men, whether poor or rich. See some other ladies, if they have lost their husbands and they're still young, maybe in their 20, late twenties or in their early thirties or even in their forties, uh, they'll be making some uh, maneuvering. They'll be showing themselves off and they'll be trying to do something so that because if I don't do that, they will not know that I'm still interested in getting married. But there's a lady, this rules said the Lord will do it. I leave it in the hands of God. And she did not follow any young man, whether poor or rich. What the Lord do to her? Look at chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 9, And Boaz said unto the elders of all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilons and Malons of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, so to raise up the name of the dead upon the inheritance, and the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gauge of his place ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses, the Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrata, and famous in Bethlehem, and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh, whom Tema bear unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee, all of, the, of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was, she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare his son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which has not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And it, say, and it shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter in law, which loveth thee, and which is better to thee than seven sons, has born him. And Ami took the child and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi. And he called his name Obed. And he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. See what came to Ruth. See the blessing. See the opportunity. See the glorious thing that the Lord did for her because she obeyed the Lord fully. And as the Lord is calling us to obey him, whatever our circles or difficulties or persecutions might have been, the same blessings the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus' name. And the Lord himself is telling us that what eyes have not seen, what ears have not heard, the Lord himself is going to give unto us as we are obedient to the word of the Lord in First Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. 
But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The things that are so great, the things that are so deep, the things that the Lord himself is revealing to us what he said he will do, is going to reveal to us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. And I pray that uh, this, uh, uh, this very week, the Lord will reveal more of it to us by his power in Jesus' name. In Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Paul the Apostle said, I didn't allow all my difficulties to hinder me. I didn't allow all those obstacles to be a hindrance unto me. I went on and on, doing the will of God. And I came to Troas, I discovered the Lord had granted me an open door. The Lord will grant you an open door. Revelation chapter 3 verse 8 verse 9. Revelation chapter 3 verses 8 and 9. I know thy words. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Be rest assured, no man can shut this door. The door of opportunity, and the door of privilege, and the door of promotion, and the door of answered prayer. The Lord has set before you an open door, and no man can shut that door. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. That's a secret. That's the very foundation of having that blessing upon us. You have kept my word and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, and, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. The Lord is saying that this is going to be your, the time of your breakthrough. He has set a door before you now. And this week is going to be a special week. And many of us now, we're standing before that open door. And many people are, you know, they, some people are afraid. Am I going to go through the door? I want you to pray as you stand up right now. To pray and to tell the Lord, this open door. Lord, pull me through the open door. Drag me through the open door. If there is anything that is pulling me back, anything that is tying me down, pull me through this open door. The open door to my breakthrough. The open door to my blessing. The open door to my miracle, the open door to impossibilities becoming possible in my life, and my kind of uh, standing back or staying back or dragging my feet, or am I just kind of holding on, oh Lord I see that the, the door is open already, you will pull me through, you will pull me through hold my hand, oh Lord hold my hand, I see the door is open right now, I'm not going to listen to those voices of the enemy I'm not going to listen to those challenges from Satan, I'm not going to listen to those obstacles before me. Here is opportunity. Here is opportunity. Opportunity to be saved. Opportunity to be healed. Opportunity to be delivered. Opportunity to have miracles. Opportunity to have children. Opportunity to have great mighty things happening to you. The door is open before you. And you are telling the Lord, pull me through. Pull me through. Anything tying me down. Anything time making me to look back. Anything that is making me to be reserved. Anything that is not helping me that I'm standing there, I cannot go through the open door. Hold my hand, drag me on, pull me through. I want to go through this open door, Lord. This open door that is set before me, I will go through it. I will go through it. I will go through it. The open door, opportunities have come, the privileges have come, and the miracle has come already. Don't look at the obstacles. Don't look at the obstacles. Look at your God. Look at your God. And the Lord will do great mighty things in your life. This is a week for you to have that breakthrough. You have the master key already. And the time has come to use that master key. And the door that is open before you. That the Lord himself will pull you through. And you will be obedient to the Lord. And great will be your blessing. And the enemies will see today. Bible fire will come into you. 
great glorious things will happen to you. The Lord will manifest himself in your life. You are telling the Lord now, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. The open door is before me. Yes, Lord, I believe the open door is before me. And I'm going to go through that open door. I'm going to go through that open door. Oh, Lord, here I am. Here I am. You will hold my hand. You will pull me through that open door. Nothing, nothing will drag me back. People, no, they will not hinder me. People, no, they will not hinder me. Difficulties, no, they will not hinder me. I'm going to go through. I have a persecution. Lord, beyond that persecution, pull me through. I have a pride like Naaman. I will not allow pride. I will not say, well, that's for sinners. I will not say that's just for newcomers. Even though I'm an old timer, I'm not going to allow pride to shut me in and to keep me back. You will pull me through that open door in spite of what the devil might try to suggest. Oh Lord, I'm going to go through that open door. Open door before you. Opportunities before you. Glorious opportunities before you. That every great obstacle the Lord will throw away. And the Lord will demolish. And the Lord will throw down. And you say, Lord, here I come. Here I come. My week of opportunity. My period of opportunity. My time of opportunity. Pull me through that open door. I will not allow people to hinder me. Do you remember blind Bartimaeus? While Jesus was passing through Jericho. And then he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And the people told him to hold his peace. They told him to keep quiet. That's what people will do. The people will try to hinder you. Your friends will try to hinder you. Your neighbors will try to hinder you. But they cried the more a great deal, Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the Lord told him to wait, to, to stand still. And then the Lord stood still and this, they called him. And they, called, they said, be of good care. Be of good comfort. He called us thee. Don't allow people to hinder you. Don't allow the principalities. They may come to you in the night and whisper to you in the night. They may want to invite you to another place. They may want to tell you that this is not the time. You will not allow those principalities or even a false prophet to tell you, I saw a vision about you and I'm praying for you. Let us go somewhere and we're going to pray and fast and we're going to do this and that. You will not allow any false prophet to hinder you. This is your day. This is your time. This is your moment of miracle that you not allow any false prophet or even your prosperity, looking for money, looking for money. I want to go to work. I want to do this. I want to do that. I am in the night shift. I therefore I will not be able to come. Don't allow the seeking for money to hinder you, to take away the great blessing from you. You will brush every other thing aside. And nothing will hinder you because this is the day and this is the time of the open door. I have the pleasure, the pleasures of the flesh. I need to sleep. I need to rest. I've been working so hard these days. And I need some time off. And this time of uh, the crusade, I think I just need time off to myself. You will not allow the ease and the pleasure of the flesh to hinder you. You will come through this open door. Let the Lord pull you through the open door and say, Lord, nothing will keep me back. Nothing will keep me back. And don't let your position hinder you. Don't let your position hinder you. Either position in the church or position in the place of work or position anywhere. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, the open door is before me. The open door is before me. And you will pull me through. You will pull me through. You will pull me through. I'm going to go through the open door. The Lord is calling you. And the Lord is saying, this is your day. This is your day. If the Lord is challenging you to obey him in one area or the other, and the Lord is saying, don't allow disobedience in any small thing, in any big thing, don't allow any disobedience to hinder you. Don't allow disobedience to hinder you. Just say, Lord, give me the grace. Give me the grace. It may be I need to say sorry to that, uh, to that neighbor, sorry to that uh, woman, or sorry to that director, or sorry to the, uh, to the man manager in my place of work. I'm not going to allow pride to hinder me. I just go there, confess your person one to another. That that ye may be healed, the effectual prayer of a, a effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It may be somebody has offended you. 
and you're holding that to your mind just forgive and let go as you forgive and let go then the blessings will flow into your life just tell the lord oh lord i'm not holding on to anything i'm not holding on to anything i'm looking on to jesus the author and the finisher of my faith looking on to jesus the author and the finisher of my faith this is going to be my week this is going to be my week a week of opportunity a week of the open door a week of the blessing of god oh lord send it down send it down and while you are praying you might say little hand like, like a cloud and you know you are praying and praying and, have you seen anything not yet Just pray again have you seen anything not yet pray again have you seen anything not yet pray again you have you seen anything not yet then at the seventh time you say little hand like a cloud and say yes i believe god has done it the abundance of rain is coming the power of the lord is coming the provision of the lord is coming me and i'm going to have the blessing of the lord opportunities breakthrough glorious opportunities glorious breakthrough fulfilled blessing of god coming upon your life this is your time this is your time this is your time you're going to have that open door behold i said before thee an open door and no man can shut it for there was a little strength and thou hast catch my word and hast not denied my name you pray keep on praying pray before you go and just give everything to the lord and say lord this week i'm going to keep my appointment with you in obedience to the lord and the lord says he will do what he promised that he will do he will do what he promised he will do an open door before you an opportunity before you the appalling of the blessings of god before you be faithful to the lord be obedient to the lord and ye shall eat the good of the land